Um, my colleague Dave White and I, we both work for uh, Rise Up East New York, which is a community driven and led campaign working towards combating the underlying chronic diseases that are impacting in particular East New York. Um, we have high rates of what are some called lifestyle chronic diseases and 14% of the, our community has diabetes, 34% uh, have hypertension or high blood pressure. And um, we fundamentally believe that it's the community and the people living in our community that can make um, a difference and to have a better lifestyle, demand that we have access to um, high quality health care, and it begins in the community. And so for that, we're extremely honored that we have an opportunity to come share some of our uh, passion about uh, caring for kidneys in particular. And um, we, we actually titled our, our talk today, We Are Not at Risk for Disease Because of the Color of Our Skin. So often you hear uh, African-Americans are at higher risk for hypertension or diabetes or kidney disease. And we really hope that we can shed some light on how um, we need to rephrase and reframe that and, and change the narrative. And um, so we wanted to start with diabetes because diabetes is actually the leading cause of kidney failure. Um, but the question is how are blood sugar and um, kidneys related? And uh, it's important for us to know that they are actually uh, quite uh, related. Oh, thank you. There's the presentation. That um, they're actually uh, very much related. And um, when the amount of sugar in our blood gets too high, um, the kidneys actually have to work overtime. And um, this excess sugar actually damages very small filtering units at our kidneys that do, do the work to keep our blood clean. Um, once over time, if this sugar damages enough of these filters, we actually the, the, uh, we can't get those filters back. When, when the filters are broken because of excess sugar, um, it's, it's, they're damaged. And so that's why often it can take years for kidneys to reveal that they've had damage um, because of diabetes. And so because of this, we definitely need to have our kidneys screened frequently. If you have a history of diabetes, it's important because this is a very slowly progressing damage. Nonetheless, damage is occurring. Long term high blood sugar often results in kidney failure. So uh, kidneys are critical. To, to for life we have to have kidneys to uh, properly function um, in order to sustain life so a few quick facts is that uh, more than 37 million americans suffer from chronic kidney disease that's actually one in seven people have kidney disease and I, I would back up and say kidney disease can be silent because of the fact that it takes a long time for the damage to occur. It can be silent, which is why as many as nine out of 10 people who have kidney disease are not aware that they have kidney disease. Um, we know that kidney disease is more common in non-Hispanic black adults. We know that black people are four times more likely to have kidney failure than whites. And kidney failure is the eighth leading cause of death. So when we look at these facts, one of the questions we should ask is, is it because of the color of our skin that black people are more prone to kidney disease? And actually the answer is uh, a resounding, uh, no, that is not that is not true. You are not at risk for kidney disease and or failure because of the color of our skin. And what I want to just point out here is that when we look overall at at how health is maintained, only 10 percent of our health depends on the providers, the clinics and the hospitals. 30 percent is due to our genetic heritage. But 
This is a point I don't want anyone to miss. 60% of our health is a result of the environment around us and the choices we make. And often these choices are determined by where we live and what we have access to. So people are not at risk for kidney disease because of race. Uh, people are at risk because of systemic inequities that affect health. And this is a, a foundation to our Rise Up East New York campaign. We believe that health occurs in the community. That's how we, the housing we have, the job opportunities we have, the access to education, food security, what type of medical treatment centers we have access to. So when we think about where can we make the change, it's in the community where we need to make the change uh, in terms of having better health, considering the fact that 60% of that is occurring where we live. So I wanted to just um, have us talk a little bit about what kidneys do. Um, kidneys are so resilient, but they have so many jobs to do. And um, so if they were to stop working, there's a lot that happens that uh, to the body. So just so that you know, kidneys actually remove toxins or waste from the blood and turns that waste into urine. The kidneys are also fundamental in maintaining balanced levels of electrolytes and fluids. So those are like our sodium and potassium. Um, our kidneys are needed to be properly functioning to keep these levels stable. The kidneys regulate several hormones. Um, they help keep our bones healthy and they actually help make red blood cells. So they are an essential part of, 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 our, of our health. So the, the uh, next thing I wanted to mention was um, what are the difference between chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease? And when you hear end-stage kidney disease, that's also referred to as kidney failure. So chronic kidney disease is when the kidneys begin to lose the ability to filter the blood and do all of those other jobs that they have to do. So this is when, if our blood sugars are remaining high, we are actually damaging and breaking those filters. This is when we have what we call chronic kidney disease. And um, this is where hopefully, if we can control our blood sugars and our blood pressure, um, we won't get to this stage. But if we do, we don't wanna get to end stage kidney disease or kidney failure. And that's when the kidneys lose um, almost all of their ability to function. And when that happens, because kidneys are required to sustain life, we have to do an intervention. Um, we, we need either to consider dialysis or a kidney transplant in order to live. So knowing the signs of kidney disease, because it is, it is a silent disease until it gets into uh, an advanced stage, some of the signs are fatigue, low energy, difficulty concentrating, retaining fluid. Uh, some people complain of dry, itchy skin, sleep disturbances, foamy urine, and frequent urination at nighttime. So with proper regular screening and knowing these signs, um, it, these are two important things to do uh, to make sure that we know the health of our the status of the health of our kidneys. So what are the risk factors? So we already know that diabetes is the, um, the leading cause of kidney failure, um, high blood pressure, obesity, heart disease, and a family history of kidney disease. And these are often referred to as lifestyle diseases because most of these, with the exception of family history of kidney disease, we have the ability to, to control. We have the ability to, uh, to monitor our, uh, what we eat, what we, the physical activity, what we're doing, losing weight, uh, making choices like choosing the whole foods over processed foods, quitting smoking, and um, moderate alcohol intake. So knowing what you can do to prevent these risk factors will help protect your kidneys. 
And I just want to reiterate to get tested frequently um, and, and know what you're just like we're trained to know what our blood pressure is. We should know what our kidney um, function is. So like I mentioned, if we develop kidney failure, we have to think of a, a treatment intervention. And um, that is dialysis, kidney transplant, or managing the symptoms medically. Uh, medical management is somewhat limited in terms of how long that can go on. But, uh, but in order to sustain life, we will have to do either dialysis or kidney transplant. And at this time, I'm so honored to turn it over to my colleague, Dave White, who's going to um, share a transformation in his life at, with you all. Um, so um, I made a lot of uneducated lifestyle choices um, as a younger adult and even as an older adult. And uh, my story is kind of a cautionary tale. Uh, the choices that we make uh, every single day are important. Um, if we could have uh, the next slide, please. Um, I, I can't see the slide, so I hope that you're looking at a, a, a lot of pictures of me. Um, I was born in 1961, and uh, by the time I entered high school, um, I'd already had uh, my first beer. Uh, I'd started smoking cigarettes in uh, my junior year of high school. Uh, while I was a starter on the varsity basketball team. And uh, I served in the United States Army for two years in the early 1980s. And um, I continued the unhealthy habits that I picked up as a teenager while I served our country. So um, let's jump ahead to the year 2000. I was an IT manager at a law firm by then. And you can see in this photograph that I had mastered the sedentary lifestyle. Uh, what was even worse was that by then, many years had passed since I had an annual physical. Uh, my priorities were upside down. Uh, there was always something going on at work or after work uh, that I thought was more important than scheduling a checkup. Dave, we were, we were talking about that period in time where with dialysis, you were able to then um, get assistance and encouragement from the social worker and you were open to hearing um, options. So that, that's where we were. Yes, um, I was a, a real hard head. Um, I was like the bad boy in my dialysis clinic. Um, I thought that I knew my body uh, better than the people that were trying to keep me alive. Um, you know, that on, on the screen, you're, you're seeing a photo of me in Thanksgiving Day 2006. Uh, that was at my brother Owen's uh, apartment in Astoria, Queens. Um, he's uh, the good looking guy in the back. And uh, between uh, us is uh, our beautiful sister, Adrian. And that's my mom at the bottom. Uh, she's in her 80s and uh, she's still going strong. Now, if, if you can recognize me next to Owen, uh, that was me back then. Um, it was hot that day because, you know, the turkey was in the oven. But you can see I'm the only one that was sweating. Um, I was obviously uh, pretty unhealthy at that time. Um, that's what, uh, you know, years of uh, smoking cigarettes, drinking too much alcohol, eating too much of the wrong foods, and not getting checkups looks like. And, um, you know, I remember about that time or a few years before, um, I think um, one of the things Nancy might have mentioned as a uh, symptom of kidney disease is uh, foamy urine. And um, I remember distinctly having that uh, in the morning, but uh, not having any health literacy. Um, I was drinking a lot of beer at the time. And, you know, in my mind, I, I thought it was normal. You know, bubbles go in, bubbles come out. Um, but um, I, I didn't think to, uh, to get checked out. Uh, once one of my colleagues at work said, you know, Dave, you're, you're just not looking as good as you used to. Maybe you should go check, get checked out. But um, I ignored that advice. 
Um, and uh, that actually, um, it, it, it caught up to me. Um, you know, I had no idea how important kidney health is. Um, if we could uh, go ahead uh, to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so this is a photo of me uh, about two and a half years later. Um, I was really happy that day because um, I tried on my high school basketball warm-up jersey and it fit. Um, it fit for the first time in a long time. You know, that jersey uh, that was almost 30 years old or maybe even over 30 years old when I put it on and it looks almost brand new because I couldn't fit into it for decades, so I couldn't wear it out. A few months later, I did notice that I was getting weaker. And, uh, you know, that's another sign that something might be going on. But um, I thought that it was because I'd stopped exercising. Uh, my wife knew better, though. Um, one Friday evening um, that October, she insisted that uh, we go to the emergency room the next day so I could get examined. And I agreed. We got there on a Saturday morning. Uh, by then, I was so weak that I couldn't make it up two flights of stairs at the hospital emergency room entrance. I made it up the first flight of stairs under my own power, and uh, that was as far as I could go. It was like my feet were uh, stuck in cement. Uh, they carried me the rest of the way in a wheelchair and uh, checked me in, uh, drew some blood and ran some tests. And it wasn't long after that that I heard the words that um, changed our lives forever. Um, your kidneys are no longer working. Um, to say that I was unprepared for what was happening uh, would be a huge understatement. I was shocked and I was angry at the world and um, I had to start emergency dialysis right away. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, if you've never seen one, this is a hemodialysis machine and machines like this kept me alive for almost six years. Uh, they, uh, they function as artificial kidneys, but they don't do nearly as good a job as kidneys do. Um, you'll notice that list to the right of the machine is shorter than the list that was uh, Nancy provided a few minutes ago. Uh, kidneys do their work slowly and gently and they work 24 seven. But uh, when I did in-center hemodialysis, I did it three hours a week, four hours at a time. And that's just 12 hours out of a 168 hour week that I was getting my blood cleaned. And that took a toll on my body. I would feel uh, washed out and tired after my dialysis sessions. And by the time I felt like myself again, it was time to go back to dialysis. Um, you know, most adults who do in-center dialysis don't work either because they're too sick or because holding down a job is just too challenging. And I was one of those people uh, between traveling back and forth to dialysis and the dialysis itself, it was a job in and of itself. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, a lot of people learn they have kidney disease um, at the same time that they learn that their kidneys are failing, and that's what happened to me. Um, so I had that emergency surgery uh, to have a central venous catheter put in my chest. Uh, the catheter, is a, it's a long, thin tube that uh, got inserted into a large vein. The other end had two connections uh, that sent my blood back and forth to the dialysis uh, machine through sterile tubing. Uh, it's meant to be used for a short period of time until a more permanent access can be created. Um, and that's uh, because there are a lot of complications that can come with the catheter and the most important one is infection. Um, you're not supposed to get a catheter wet, so showering wasn't fun and baths were out of the question. Uh, in the spring of 2010, I had a second surgery to have uh, a fistula created in my left arm. Uh, a vascular surgeon connected a vein to an artery in my upper arm. Um, so the blood flow in the vein could increase and I could get dialyzed faster. Um, you see the arrow pointing to uh, my fistula that points out the bumps in my arm. Uh, that's because veins are actually a special type of muscle. So when the vein got more blood flow, it had to work harder. And when you work out muscles, they get bigger. 
And I was kind of self-conscious about that. And sometimes I felt ashamed, but eventually I got used to it. And now when people ask me what uh, those bumps are on my arm, I just tell them that's a fistula. And I used it when I did dialysis. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So like I said, I was the problem child in my dialysis clinic. Um, you know, there were weeks when I only went to dialysis once or twice a week instead of three times a week. And that was the worst thing that I could have done. Um, at one point, the charge nurse actually told me that if I missed three sessions in a row, I would have to check into the hospital before returning. So as soon as I heard that, I immediately thought, oh, I could miss two sessions in a row and I'll be fine. And it was the exact opposite of what I should have been thinking. But uh, that nonsense stopped on uh, April 7, 2010, when I was called into a meeting uh, to talk about why I was skipping dialysis so much. And at the end of that meeting, a nurse told me, we're here to help you, but you have to do your part or you may not be around much longer. And that message hit home hard. Um, when I got home a few months later, I mean, a few hours later, uh, I looked at myself in the bathroom mirror that's in the room right behind me. And uh, I thought I looked at myself and I said, you know, they're right. Um, this is on you and you can do better. You know, I that's a, a moment that will always stay with me. And from that day on, I went to dialysis three times a week, no excuses. And after a couple of months, I started to feel not as bad. And I thought, you know, maybe these professionals know what they're talking about. So I stuck with the program. And by the fall of 2010, I thought that I might have a future again. So that, that photo of that, that somewhat good looking guy, that was a photo that was taken for my uh, paratransit card, my paratransit ID. Um, I had that card renewed uh, twice, once every three years. And I insisted that they keep that same photo on the card because I wanted to, um, I wanted to, it to be a reminder to myself of, of what, what I'd gone through and uh, where I was now. So um, right about then, the new year was approaching, and I decided to make a couple of uh, New Year's resolutions that um, involve some lifestyle changes. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, I think um, I heard the word push-ups um, at some point, so you might have heard about that. But um, the day before I had that, um, uh, really a shock, um, the day before, which uh, was December 31st, which was actually my birthday, um, December 31st, 2010, that's the last day I had a cigarette. So I'm a little over 10 years smoke-free now. Uh, the very next day, uh, New Year's Day, one of my resolutions was to start exercising again. And having been a former athlete and a, a veteran, you know, I was no stranger to exercise. But when I tried to do push-ups that morning, I couldn't do a single one. And I, from that moment, I, I, I just couldn't believe that I had fallen that far. Um, I didn't think, I just said, Dave, that's not you. You have to do something about that. So, you know, I went to work that year and um, the photo you're looking at is one that I sent my brother Owen. That was in December of 2011. I remember I did 117 push-ups that day. That year I did over 15,000 push-ups and I did a count last week and I'm up over 180,000 push-ups right now. Um, so um exercising made me stronger physically and mentally dialysis became less taxing and my looks got better um i remember one day uh, in dialysis i was walking by the receptionist i said hello and she said dave you know you're you're just a different person now you you speak to people and you're friendly and you don't look a, like a dialysis patient anymore and boy, did I, you know, straighten my back up and, you know, I kind of walked a little prouder because that was, um, uh, I, I just couldn't think of anything better um, to hear. So some of you may be wondering how I was able to maintain that focus for an entire year without letting up. And I still haven't let up. Um, next slide, please. 
So January 2nd, I woke up and I asked myself two questions. The first was, do you, I have time to exercise? And I did that day. And the second question was, okay, um, I have time. But uh, the next question was very important because back then, um, I was really still wasn't in very good physical condition. I had to ask myself if I was physically able to exercise that day, if I did a check for pains and just overall how I felt. And I answered that question, yes. And day after day, week after week, month after month, I asked myself those two questions. And when I answered them, yes, I would get in a workout uh, in that very gym um, that was in our apartment complex, or I go out and run. I call it running, but if you saw me back then, you would call it something else. You might even call have called 311 because um, I didn't look very good, but I was doing the best that I could. But um, I was so focused that it was a year and a half before I asked myself those two questions and answered them yes and took a day off. Um, and I took that day off just to prove that I wasn't like a robot, you know, um, that's, that's how locked in I was. And that drive, um, that actually helped me get a kidney transplant because one of the first things they ask when you're evaluated is uh, one of the first things they look at is um, whether you go to dialysis um, on a regular basis. And um, I certainly did that at that time. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, that's me um, in George Washington University Hospital. Um, a few days after getting my transplant, um, I didn't want a transplant for years because in the dialysis clinic, all I heard about were, um, and all I saw, more importantly, were people with failed transplants. So I saw no reason to go through that. I was very fortunate to have a social worker who was always positive and told me to keep my options open. And sure enough, after a couple of years, I said, you know, there's, there's got to be a different way of doing things. And I decided to get evaluated for a kidney transplant. I was very fortunate to have a transplant clinic open up um, in the same uh, building where I did dialysis. Um, and so it was no, uh, it was a no brainer to go ask if I could get evaluated. Uh, that happened in March of 2015. I got listed um, on, I believe, June 26th, and I got a call for the kidney the very next day. Um, so it was sort of destined to happen because that hardly happens um, to anyone. I named my kidney Hercules because we knew that I knew that we had a lot of work to perform together. My donor was a 21-year-old victim of gun violence, and the family chooses to remain anonymous, and I have to uh, honor that every single day, and that's what I do. Um, I know we're running short on time, so if we could uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, that's my transplant family. Uh, the good-looking guy in the middle is... Uh, my transplant surgeon, Dr. Keith Melanson, and the beautiful lady on the far right is my kidney twin, Leticia. Uh, we both received a kidney from the same deceased donor, and we remain a uh, family to this day. Um, next slide, please. Um, so being a kidney transplant uh, uh, recipient uh, is, um, I have to take care of my gift. Um, a kidney transplant isn't a cure for kidney disease, but uh, most people would agree that it's better than dialysis. Uh, I have to take a lot of medications. Um, I have to take steroids, and in so doing, uh, I'm predisposed to becoming pre-diabetic. So I have to really uh, watch my diet and uh, make sure that it's a kidney-friendly diet. Uh, I get regular checkups now, like I should have many, many years ago. But so I just do the best that I can going forward. And I take immunosuppressants so my immune system doesn't attack my transplanted kidney. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm always at risk for COVID and uh, the flu and uh, opportunistic infections. So I always have to take precautions. Next slide, please. Um, I believe at this point, I will just uh, turn it over uh, to my colleague, Nancy, to uh, close us out.
Thank you, Dave, so much. I'm so glad we got you back on because your story, like I tell you every time, is so impactful. Um, I, I just want to thank everybody here for allowing Dave and myself to be a part of this. We're both very passionate about educating the community. And I also just want to reiterate the fact that um, just like we're, we're, we're honoring this historic um, signing of the legislation yesterday that Juneteenth is now a federal holiday, I mean, it really reminds us that we've got to keep the momentum going and we've got to remember that nobody is at risk because of the color of their skin. And I think for too long, we have sent that message out to the community. And so it's uh, we have the control and the power to how healthy we are and how we maintain our bodies. I just want to reiterate Dialysis is not what you have to have if you have kidney disease. There are interventions that can be done if you're screened and the disease is caught early in the in the process. So thank you again. We were this was a great opportunity. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, David, and thank you, Rise Up New York, for the work that you are out there. East New York for the work that you are out there doing. Um, and I'm grateful to have you here. Thank you to your donor, David. Yes. Pleasure to have your testimony. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much for having us.